My first job was at a TV station. I had a little bit different working history than many people because uh, actually, even before it was a job, I started interning. And uh, by that, I mean kind of kind of free help and just hanging out in a TV station weather office. It was an early uh, young memory of mine. And the meteorologists there at, the, at that station uh, became friends. They became mentors in many ways. And I think the chief meteorologist especially became a life mentor to me. In fact, I think of him often, even to this day. Uh, but at the time, I was in the eighth grade, at least at the start, and then in high school shortly thereafter. Right? I was, I was young. I was still finding my way in life, and, and, and I hadn't seen much. Like I, hadn't, it's, I, like I didn't do like many people do, uh, the, uh, working uh, like in a fast food place or something like that. No, this was my first experience of working anywhere or, or having any kind of responsibility like that. And this is a story, okay, so there's a, there's a piece of advice that they give to pastors, that if you share a story, make sure it's something you've worked through yourself first, because you don't want to use your congregation as your psychologist, right? <laughs> and this is a story that I've actually never told in a sermon before, because I don't think I was ready. But I think writing this sermon has made me ready. Now, now I've, I've set this up so big, it's probably not going to be quite as big as it sounds. But there was a time, and I think it, it, was, a, it was a few years in, so I was probably mid-high school or so, that I broke something in the weather office. Now, if any of you really want to know, I'd be happy to explain what it was. It's a computer thing. It would take a lot of explanation just to explain what it was. But it made one of the main computers in the weather office go out for about two weeks while we waited for the appropriate part to come. And I felt terrible. It was an honest mistake. I was, I was young, and I did make a mistake. You know, it's the kind of mistake anybody might make when they're just starting out. But in this case, it had, it had it like, it really reverberated. It caused a lot of problems in that weather office and in that TV station. And as you can imagine, I was in some kind of mix of feeling terrible and denial because of the problems that I had caused, especially since I knew I was so fortunate to be there. And I remember at one point that chief meteorologist, who was such a life mentor to me, went into the news director, like the boss's office, and I felt some tension, and he came back, and I never heard anything else about it again. Looking back, I realized that that was the moment that he stood up for me. I didn't know how to handle that. I still felt guilty, but I also felt grateful. Now, I bring this up because today's topic is about the heart of Christianity. And I think this story gets to it. This series is called Basics. What I wanted to do was talk about what, what are the, the core things that we believe as Christian? What makes us Christians? And with a little side spin of what makes us United Methodists. You know, this is a time in the world when we need to remember who we are as Christians. But in the, in the, in the course of the United Methodist Church, you know, we've had all of these disaffiliations is the word that we come, came up with. Churches that left the denomination through a process that we set up, mostly over L LGBTQ issues. It was a cause of much division. And, uh, and I think as we emerge from that, and as we emerge from that very well, by the way, uh, and as we, as, we, as we experience God's grace anew in all of it, I think it's a good time to remember who we are as United Methodists too. So that's what this series is about. What is at the heart and core of what it means to be Christian? And what, what are our United Methodist views that are our unique way of looking at those things? And today's is on grace. Now, grace is what I think is at the core of what it means to be Christian. I don't suppose anybody could name one thing that was at the center of what it means to be Christian, but if, if you pressed me, grace would be my answer. And I want to look at it from three perspectives. The first one is Jesus, as you might imagine. Now, at the most basic level, grace is something that is undeserved. Oftentimes, it's something that's even unasked for. But it is a, it is a kindness. It is a gift. It is a blessing. It is a forgiveness that we do not deserve, yet we receive anyway. 
Now, nothing captures that better than the cross and the resurrection. As Christians, there's a central story around which we shape our lives and our beliefs. And I'm guessing that even if this is your first time ever being in church, you've probably still heard this story because it begins with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Evil and uh, Garden Garden of Eden. No, not the Garden of Evil. That's a little later. <laughs> no, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and there's the whole tree and the snake, and then, you know, another time we can go into detail because that 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 myth, and I mean myth in the the original is sense of the word, that story that shapes us uh, has so much richness within it. But the broad version of the story is that, uh, is that the people were not strong enough. Those first human beings were not strong enough to be all that they could be. It's where our phrase, we're only human, comes from. Uh, it, because we know that we mess up sometimes, that we make mistakes. Uh, by the end of the story, of, of course, God is mad as you might, uh, as you might imagine, and they're, they're uh, kicked out of the Garden of Eden. They're kicked out, and, and all of a sudden, their lives are no longer shaped by trust in God, by, uh, by reliance on God, but instead by their own pride and by, by, their own, uh, by, by their own thinking that they can raise themselves up by their own bootstraps as evidenced in the apple. But as that story continues, God doesn't give up. God keeps trying to call them back. And so the entire story of the Bible is, is people drifting away from God and God calling them back and bringing them back, people falling and God picking them up, people stumbling stumbling again and God helping them yet again until finally Jesus comes and on the cross you know th- th- there are some Christians that get kind of ground out in the cross and some of the the sacrificial bits of it and the way and the way that it fulfills some of the laws in the Old Testament and all that but I think what really matters there is that Jesus dying on the cross was not only a showing that God understands our pain that God understands suffering that God understands our plight but also that God cares enough about us to go to those links that we might be whole. The cross is that moment where it's forgiven. It's grace, right? We've shown again and again throughout all of human history that we're not strong enough. We keep trying, we keep trying to think we can do it on our own, but we simply can't. But the cross shows us that God forgives us. It's grace. It's undeserved. But I think underappreciated is the resurrection. Because as important as the cross is, Easter, the resurrection, is even more important still because God didn't just stop at forgiveness. Because with only forgiveness, we're just going to fall and stumble again, right? But instead, in the resurrection, God shows how God is changing everything, how God is rebuilding, how God is making all things new, how God is transforming each one of us into something that's better. Now tell me, do we deserve it? No. And that's grace. God made us wonderful and beautiful. God made us good creations. But it's only by God's grace that we are able to live into it and become all that God made us to be. Now, there's a big part of me that wants to tell you the entire story of the prodigal son right now. Uh, That's in Luke chapter 15. If you want some really good afternoon reading, go look up Luke 15 and the prodigal son. There is no story in the Bible that captures that story of grace quite like that one. And sometimes we'll we'll do an entire sermon on it too. But do you see the grace from my story earlier? I mean, can you see the connection already? You know, I had broken something in that weather office and they, I deserved to be kicked out. <laughs> in fact, I deserved to pay for it too, for that matter, even though my young self couldn't possibly have done so. But instead, that chief meteorologist who had become my mentor by that point already had grace, as did the others that were around. So that's the Jesus side of things, or at least, at least the basics of it. And, and, and that's what forms the core of Christianity, is that God continually gives us what we don't deserve, and God continually raises up above what we're capable of on our own. Now, that may be the best way to say it of all. But what's the United Methodist view of it? 
You know, the different denominations of Christianity, they have, they, they, there are different beliefs and there are substantial differences every here and there. But to tell you the truth on most things, I don't know, 90% of things, we believe the same basic things. It's a question of what we choose to emphasize. It's a question of what we think is the most important of all the things we agree on. And there's a reason I'm starting with grace, because not only is it the core of Christianity in my view, but John Wesley, United Methodism's founder, especially put a lot of weight on grace. And in fact, he talked about grace so much that he divided it into types of grace so that we could appreciate all the different ways God's grace comes to us. And, and I have them on the screen here. Preventing grace, justifying grace, and sanctifying grace. Now take notes if you want, but let me tell you what they mean. Preventing grace is, now this is 1700s uh, uh, language, in fact from even before Amazing Grace, and John Wesley's words was actually prevenient grace, but I've never heard anybody modern ever use the word prevenient. What he means by that is God's grace for us even before we're aware of it. You know, whenever we have a baptism, I talk about uh, how there's three promises that are made at that font when we are baptized and when we enter into that kind of relationship with God and the church. And one of them is God's love for us that's there even if we don't want it. <laughs> that's there even if we don't know about it. That God walks with us regardless. That first promise is God's promise and it's true whether we want it or not. That's provenient grace. That even if we live our lives with blinders on, even if we live our lives with a blindfold on and have no idea what we're doing, no idea that, that we even need God to lift us up, God is still there for us. God is still there working in our lives. And in some ways, it's moving, moving us closer to him. In other ways, it's simply helping us when we fall, shaping our lives in ways that we cannot see. That is God's preventing grace. God's justifying grace is the cross and the resurrection, what we talked about before, about how God uh, lifts us up when we fall, about how God makes us more than we are. And sanctifying grace is important in part because some Christians, well, I wouldn't, I don't know if they believe this or not, but they act as though once you're saved, quote unquote, that's it. But part of what United Methodists believe is that we're a continuing work in progress. That whatever it may happen to mean to be saved, that's another question altogether. That we keep growing even after that. We keep being made into saints. That's where the word sanctifying comes from. We, God keeps working on us and we keep growing uh, even after that moment comes. Even after we've accepted God's love, the growth doesn't stop. And so from Wesley, as, and as United Methodists, we see this picture of God's grace working in nuance and in detail from before we're part of the church, from before we even know what grace is, it's working in us, that's the preventing part, all the way to when God keeps moving us on to perfection, even as we continue to grow. Now, the third perspective I want to talk about grace is going to get more, uh, get, get a little closer to earth, all right? And that is us. Because so far, all we've talked about is God's grace, right? And that's appropriate because God's grace is so great and so much bigger than any of us is. But the truth is, we are incomplete unless we learn grace too. Again and again in Scripture, we see it. We prayed the Lord's Prayer just a few minutes ago. And what does it say? Forgive us. Say it with me as we forgive those who trespass against us. Because it's not enough just to receive God's grace. Well, in a sense it is, but we're incomplete unless we also learn to extend that grace to one another. Unless we learn to, 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 to live out the grace that God models for us. And that happens in terms of forgiveness when somebody's wronged us. But an undeserved gift is more than just that. It also means living with the spirit of generosity. It means living with the spirit of being open to one another. It means living with a spirit that says, I want to be here for you as much as God is for me to everyone that you meet. Now, that sounds like a lot, but that, that attitude of grace, that spirit of grace, that life of grace is something that we need to, we, we need to embody too. Now, I should say, I should point out that it does include the forgiveness piece too. 
Because all of us carry around grudges from time to time. All of us carry around resentments from time to time about something that's not right in the world, something that's not right in our families or our relationships. And it's natural and normal for that kind of grudge and that kind of resentment to grow in each of us from time to time. That's part of what it means to be human. But God's grace calls us to rise above that. It calls us to see beyond our grudges and our resentments, to forgive those that are around us. Have you ever heard the phrase, resentment is like drinking a poison and then waiting for the other person to die? <laughs> Well, that's really the truth, and that's what modeling God's grace, in our, well, that's what living the grace that God models helps us to avoid. And I think another part of it is also learning to forgive ourselves, because sometimes, well, we may not call it resentment, but sometimes the person we most need to forgive is ourselves. You know, as I was thinking about and considering whether or not I was ready to tell that story of what happened when I was uh, so many years ago in that TV station, this is what I realized, that everybody else had forgiven me but me. <laughs> you know, that, that, that the chief meteorologist, he'd forgiven me many, many years ago. God forgave me, of course. I was the one who was still carrying that baggage around. And so the grace that God has taught me meant that I needed to forgive myself two. Okay, so this series on basics is pretty heady. So I'm going to make an effort in each one of these sermons to include the phrase, here's what you need to do, <laughs> so that we don't forget that this isn't just theology. This is something that we live. This is something we take with us and something that we do. So here is what you need to do today. First, ask yourself, where do you need to ask God for forgiveness? Now, I'm not talking about stuff like my story right now. I'm talking about the places where you've stumbled in life, where you've carried around attitudes that you shouldn't, where you've carried around resentments, where, you've, where, you, have, where you have stumbled in the grander sense, or perhaps where you've neglected your walk with God, where you've, where, where you've known God's grace is there, but you haven't accepted it. Where do you need to ask God for forgiveness? Then, where do you need to forgive yourself? You know, this is the journey I've been on this week in writing this sermon, right? Where do you need to forgive yourself for your missteps? And I think we could also add to that, who do you need to go to to ask forgiveness? But then thirdly, and don't neglect this one, where do you need to forgive somewhere, someone else? Where are the resentments and the grudges that you carry around? Where, where do you need to reflect the grace that God has shown you to someone else in your life? Because if you don't, you're not whole. If you don't, you're not all that God made you to be. If you don't, you haven't fully accepted the grace that God has given you. So where do you need to forgive someone else? Okay, one last thought about grace. And this may be the biggest of all, believe it or not. And that is that grace is always bigger than we think. It's always more than we think. It's always more powerful. It's always further reaching than we think. That God's grace is always more. You know, when it came to the scripture reading for today, there were lots of choices in the Bible that I could have made. But I chose this passage from Romans because it captures this bit. And I'm going to pick it apart here. It's only a couple lines, but I want to pick it apart phrase by phrase. Okay, so it starts like this. The law stepped in to amplify the failure. Now, nothing against law. I've known some wonderful lawyers and faithful judges also. Uh, nothing against law, but think about it. We need rules to function as a society. We need rules to structure our life. But what do rules do? They show us where we fail. <laughs> and so if we put all of our trust in law, if we put all of our trust in the rules we set up for ourselves, all it does is, as, the, 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 as Romans says, all it does is amplify failure. The law stepped in to amplify the failure 
But where sin increased, grace multiplied even more. Do you hear that? Where sin, where, where, where sin increased, grace amplified all the more. In other words, there is nothing we can do. There is no, no depths to which we can fall that will not make God's grace become even bigger than that fall, that will not make everything that God is, everything that God shows us that we do not deserve on our own, there is no depth to which we can fall that will not make God's grace even bigger than any of it. The result is that grace will rule through God's righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So if we put all our trust in rules, if we put all our trust in the things that do nothing more than show us our failure, well, that's what we'll have. But where sin increases, God's grace increases all the more. And it's that grace that leads us to eternal life. And I don't mean heaven when we die. I mean full life now. I mean real life now. It's that grace. It's that grace that whenever we fall multiplies all the more that shows us again and again what this world is all about, what this life is all about. And it's what makes us whole people as God made us to be, even all the way back in the Garden of Eden. God's grace is always bigger than you think, and it is always closer than you realize. Let us pray. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. Amen.